seats on this side. And your best bet, if you're standing over there, just come through the other way. All right? Just go around and come through. Wow, it's so nice to see all of you here tonight. This is really, really an exciting night. Um, Hi, I'm Mitchell, as I know most of you, and I'm with Books and Books. And I want to thank um, the entire staff here at Books and Books for making this night happen. Um, there's Christina and Steve and Ed and Stephanie and everybody else. So let's give them a big round of applause. Well. Now, one of the things we've been doing as well is that we've now started live streaming again. Some of you may have remembered that. So this is available um, on our Facebook page, soon to be on a YouTube channel that we have as well. But it will reside for a long, long time on our Facebook page too. Um, which gives, uh, makes me say that you have a little responsibility that if you're sitting next to somebody you shouldn't be, it'll be up there for a long, long time. So I'll just warn you, um, in, this, in this viral age of ours, you never know. Um, also, because we're live streaming, and so that everyone in the live stream can hear uh, the questions, Steve will be coming around with a mic during the Q&A. And because, um, just because I know, uh, I'm going to ask that all of you make sure you do questions. We all want to get so much off our chest, but uh, so that everybody, so everybody can ask a question, that would be great, so we can hear from Ben and get his perspective on things. Um, you know, we at Books and Books do a lot of partnering, and uh, uh, we're always partner with the Miami Book Fair, which is just around the corner. Uh, we partner with a lot of different organizations. Tonight we're partnering with the uh, Betsy Hotel in South Beach. If you haven't been there, they have a remarkable reading series of their own. It's also a great kind of staycation for a weekend, if you'd like. Um, and, and they're really terrific. Um, tonight, Ben's going to be in conversation with David Adams, who's the senior editor of, Di of Digital News for Univision. Um, but first, we have someone really special that I'm going to bring up, who's going to introduce both of them. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me to see the generations of readers who have passed through and grown up here at the bookstore. Uh, Peter Campbell, PJ as we all know him, uh, has grown up here in the Books and Books community. It's been his bookstore, and uh, he's been one of ours. His parents are both great readers who instilled in him a love of the bookshop from early on. Uh, his mom, Laura Russo, who's someone that I've known for years, has been a great champion of the bookstore, and she's here with us. Uh, PJ, the reason why he's introducing him is because he's served in a variety of roles in the political sphere here in Miami. Um, both on the state and federal level. He graduated from FIU. Um, he worked in their federal relations office in DC. And in the summer of 2015, he served in the White House, in the Obama White House, in the Office of Presidential Correspondent. He has since then consulted with major Democratic groups as a fundraising consultant, including the uh, Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, the Senate Majority PAC, and the Democratic Governors Association. He currently serves as a senior legislative aide to Representative Javier Fernandez. And I just want to give a shout out to Eileen Higgins, who I just, I just have to say, she's also one of ours. She worked with us at Books and Books as a consultant for a number of months. And I can tell you from working with her up close and personal that we're in for a real treat to have her be kind of in our uh, county government. Um, but anyway, here's PJ uh, to tell us more about P Ben and his new book and to introduce our guest tonight. Please welcome PJ Kim. Thank you, Mitchell, for the introduction. I think we can all say we're pretty excited that Ben decided to come here. I heard he's only doing like 10 or 12 cities, so. Can you hear me? Better? Better? Sorry. Uh, so a lot of people, I'm sure, in 2007 
we're excited to hear about Barack Obama. He was a young, enthusiastic state senator from Illinois, and then senator, and we all knew he was a rising star in the party, but Ben had made it his singular focus to work for him. It's the only thing he wanted to do. So in this, he knew someone in the, in the campaign who would give him tasks to do, have him write op-eds, draft floor memos, anything he could do. So one day he gets a call, and the guy's like, hey, can you come help with debate prep? And he's like, yeah, I can come. Jumps at the chance. He goes, Obama goes around the room. He finally gets to Ben. And Ben says a position unpopular in the room, but he's fairly confident in what he's saying. Obama wraps the meeting up, walks over, and goes, hey, I'm Barack. I'm glad you're with us. Which I'm sure was news to Ben since they had just met. But those words would go on to change the next nine years of Ben's life. Um, Coming on as a speechwriter, Ben would go on to work on some of the most influential foreign policy speeches on the campaign trail and in the Obama presidency, from Obama's speech on the campaign trail in Cairo, or in Germany, to President Obama's speech to the Muslim world in Cairo. Um, uh, ben had this inconceivable task of figuring out what Obama wanted to do and wanted to say, uh, really the world as it should be. Ben dedicates his book to his parents. His father was a conservative attorney in Lyndon Johnson's Department of Justice, and his mom was a liberal staffer in the newly created Department of Housing and Urban Development. So Ben really had a, uh, a so Ben really had a calling to serve. Uh, about a year into the administration, Ben got promoted from speechwriter to deputy national security advisor, a role he says would define him to the wider world. Um, the role would continue to grow, and he eventually became a close advisor of the president, and some would say he even had a mind meld with him, that he knew what Obama was thinking and what he wanted to say. So this gave Ben more authority in the West Wing and allowed him to put his fingerprints all over some of the most critical pieces of foreign policy uh, of that time. So what intrigues a lot of people about this book is that he takes you behind the scenes and in the room for some of the most critical decision-making periods of the presidency, including uh, what to say after the strike on Osama bin Laden, the Syrian red line debate, the Iran nuclear deal, and the uh, negotiations with the Cuban government, which he himself led. But that's not what's the most interesting thing to me. As a Democratic staffer, albeit on a way smaller scale, um, what interests me is that he went around and gave the credit to a lot of the people who we worked with. And he told you their roles in helping shape the policy and the Obama presidency that we came to know. So for me, that was, um, that was something that I really appreciated. Uh, I also liked that he was open and honest about his role in the administration, the workload he had, and how that was constantly changing from speechwriter to deputy national security advisor to, um, to senior advisor, and then to a point where he got to pick and choose what he wanted to work on. So this book comes at a time when most of us are trying to come to grips with what's going on in the world and how we got here after these last eight years of Obama. And when I first read the title of the book, I tried to decode it and see the bigger picture. And he mentions that Obama says a lot. He wanted to tell the world as it should be. So shortly after election, uh, our election day, Ben sent the president a note. Progress doesn't move in a straight line. Obama would go on to repeat this a couple times. His version was, history doesn't move in a straight line. It zigs and it zags. That, I believe, is the world as it is. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Ben Rose, David Adams. Uh, thanks uh, for that uh, great Miami welcome. Um, and uh, such a full house, too. And for everybody who's watching on Facebook. Um, uh, it's a great uh, privilege uh, for me to, uh, to have this discussion uh, with Ben as a journalist uh, covering Cuba uh, for uh, as long as I can remember with the St. Petersburg Times and then Reuters and now with Univision. Um, a lot of us never thought we would see the day. Um, and it uh, came obviously to everybody uh, and it was intended that way uh, as a great surprise uh, in December uh, 2016. Um, and 
no, for those of you who've uh, dipped into Ben's book, it's a very wide uh, ranging book. Um, and you know, by all means, ask some questions um, about other subjects besides Cuba. Um, but I'm, I'm going to kick this conversation off um, by you know, going straight to the nitty gritty, the reason why most of you are here, but we can expand it to talk about uh, life after Obama and, and other parts of the world uh, too, which obviously Ben has been deeply involved in. So. Uh, I, you know, I'd like to start things rolling by, you know, asking, so how did Cuba uh, come to be part of the Obama legacy? Well, it's a, a great question. First of all, I'm really excited to be here. Um, the first time I came to Miami after December 17th, um, I got off the plane and there was a police escort. It, literally, they drove me in a golf cart with a bunch of police guys around me. And then everywhere I went, there were like four or five really large men, right, with earpieces. And I finally asked them, like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, we're worried about your security. Um, but in fact, actually, I was greeted with such warmth by the people here, and I've come back now probably 10 or 12 times. Um, so it's great to be here. Um, to answer your question, um, I knew Barack Obama wanted to change our Cuba policy. Um, and I talked to him about this, and he'd even said to me uh, a number of times that he felt like he wasn't telling the truth when he had to kind of defend the embargo, and he was uncomfortable going to Latin America and, and having everybody um, asking him why we're pursuing this policy. And, and, and so I knew that he wanted to change things. Um, but what I describe in the book is that you could come to work every day in the White House and only deal with the things that are coming at you. You know, we could spend all of our time in the Middle East. And after the first term, when other people were fanning out for the White House to other jobs, he said to me, is there a project you would like to take on? Is there something you'd like to do that will keep you in the White House? Um, and I said, uh, yeah, I want to I want to do Cuba. Um, because it's something that I know you want to change. But I also knew that if somebody didn't raise their hand, who was kind of a senior person in the White House, and say, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to spend the time to do this, it wouldn't happen. Um, and what had basically happened up to then is we'd come in, we'd made a bunch of changes for Cuban Americans to be able to travel and send remittances to Cuba, and then Alan Gross had been arrested, a USAID subcontractor, and that froze everything, and it kind of got put on the back burner. And I was like, well, maybe I can take this on and see if we can kind of break this logjam. And, and I knew that, again, if, if somebody didn't say at a senior level, I'll do this and this will be my project, that it, it wasn't going to happen. You know, I remember you know, when uh, December 14th uh, happened, um, and a lot of us were trying to piece together in the media, um, how did this come about? And of course, it was all a big secret. Um, uh, I was calling up the usual suspects, you know, Joe Garcia and people, and then and I was suddenly being reminded, but you know, David, have, have you you've forgotten Obama? You know, he, he he came to Miami, he came to Miami, and this is now 2014. He came to Miami in 2007, June, something like that, middle of 2000, May, 2007. Um, <laughs> Uh, at the invitation of none other than the Cuban American National Foundation. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. can we go back a little bit further? Because I know you were there uh, at, so, the, yeah. at the Intercontinental. It, it's all pretty personal to me. The first week that I went to work for Obama, he had a debate where he was asked whether he would meet with the leaders of Cuba, Iran, and North Korea. Um, uh, without preconditions, he said yes. And... It was treated as a mistake, a gaffe, he was attacked. And, and he said, no, I, with all these countries, although he didn't meet with the North Koreans, um, with all these countries, like what we're doing isn't working and, and I want to try a different approach. And we came to Miami in uh, 2007 and Jorge Moss had invited us, he was hosting us. And he uh, defended 
his approach there. You know, like the, the normal thing to do would be to kind of backtrack and say, well, I didn't really mean what I said there. But he said, no, I, 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 we're not getting anywhere with a policy of isolation. We're not getting anywhere just trying to squeeze the Castro regime. Um, I want to engage them to, to better improve the lives of the Cuban people. Um, and what was interesting is that that was well received here. And what we saw was that there was a Cuban American community in Miami that was beginning to agitate for some change. Um, and a lot of that was generational. Um, but we, we, we then, uh, the, one of the other speeches I worked from was in Little Havana where he talked about opening up family travel and remittances. And, and we started to kind of test down here the boundaries of how we might reorient this policy. And, and uh, again, one of the things that uh, surprised us when we were uh, trying to piece it all together was quite how many friends President Obama had made uh, in Miami. Um, uh, I'm, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with uh, Joe Ariola's cigarette story. Um, I, I, I've heard it so many times. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm very familiar with it. Uh, for those of you in, in the audience who, who, who don't know it, um, uh, I'll, I'll let Ben tell the story, but it was a, it was a fundraiser in Chicago um, that uh, Joe Ariola, the former Miami city manager, now the, the head of the Jackson Health uh, Trust, um, attended. Um, and why, why, why Joe Ariola attended a fundraiser for a Chicago black uh, would-be senator uh, is an interesting story. And, 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 and there began, I think, President Obama's connection to Miami. Well, you know, the thing about the Obama campaign um, is that it, it attracted kind of an eclectic group of people um, in a really almost inspiring way because he was not the establishment choice. He was not the juggernaut. You know, Hillary had kind of locked up a lot of that support. And so we, we were like a pickup team. I mean, that's how I got my job, you know, <laughs> like, let's face it, you know, I wasn't going to, was, uh, and actually, uh, just to talk about the book for a second, I mean, I'm, when I sat down to write the book, I thought what was interesting here is that, you know, I was 29 years old when I went to work for Barack Obama in 2007, relatively anonymous, uh, you know, not like the normal people who come into that type of position. You, did um, you apply or, or they, ca they came looking for you? You were recruited? Uh, I, no, I, I worked my way in. I mean, I, I, I had just worked on the 9-11 Commission and the Iraq Study Group, so I had experience in some of the issues he was going to have to deal with. And I showed up and I was like, I'll do whatever you guys want. You know, I'll, I'll write speeches, I'll write position papers, and, and ultimately that led me into that room with Obama. Um, but, you know, we, we, we attracted this mix of people who all wanted change. Um, including Cuban-Americans like Joe, um, who were saying, you know what, the old ways of doing things, people are ready to try something different. You know, they're, you know, so that applied to Cuba, but it applied to our other aspects of our foreign policy and our economic policy and our politics in general. And that's what was so magical about the OA campaign is just a sense that like, we can challenge these conventions. You know? And it was interesting when we did talk about potentially engaging Cuba, it was, viewed as like a mistake, you know, you can't say that. But the whole campaign was like about us not being trapped by convention and us being willing to say, we'll try something new. And have people like Joe and others say, yeah, people are ready for this. You know, there, there, there is a constituency that is ready for change here and, and understands that the old way of doing things doesn't hold anymore. You know, that gave us some confidence. Yeah, and, and just to round that, um, off, uh, Joe uh, snuck out of that fundraiser for a cigarette. He was trying to give up smoking, and, and so was President Obama. Uh, I've been trying for like ten years, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and they, uh, uh, Joe realized he only had a few minutes, um, and uh, he he said, "Look, um, or I think Obama asked him, you know, what is it with you guys in Miami? <laughs> why why you know why are you so? How how can a Democrat win?" in South Florida. Um, and uh, so Joe said, well, uh, change the embargo. And, and then he said, by the way, if, if you are interested, come to Miami. 
And he came, and in those days, it was he was still the manager of the city of Miami. Yeah. And so he organized um, some get-togethers at the house of Jorge Perez. Um, and uh, to, to me, that was maybe the thing that surprised a lot of people uh, in 2014, is that you guys had actually done your homework uh, on, on the policy and how it would be received here in Miami. And, and there's, there's one or two people here in the audience who also contributed to, to that um, education you guys got, yeah? Well, you know, so basically what happened is, um, you know, I described earlier how the first term things got sidetracked because of Alan Gross. In the second term, I said, I would like to do this. Um, I'd like to take this on. And um, I talked to Obama, and he said, you know, yes, you know, you, we, I'm reelected. I'd like to, to try to find out where we can be bold. Um, and so we sent a, it was me and a guy named Ricardo Zuniga, who was uh, the lead staffer at the White House for Latin America. And we sent a message to the Cubans um, proposing a secret channel. How, uh, do you, how do you do that? How do you send a message to the Cubans? So, uh, and I'm going to get back to the Cuban Americans, by the way. But, um, uh, you know, essentially, uh, let's just say it's an intelligence channel. Um, because part of what was interesting is that the Cubans did not trust our State Department because for decades they've been in a, you know, battle with the State Department across Latin America and around the world. And they saw the State Department as an adversary. In a weird way, they trusted our military, who they had exchanges with at Guantanamo, and our intelligence community, who they had exchanges with in Havana, more than the State Department. In my first meeting, by the way, with Alejandro Castro, I said to him, if you had told me that you guys would trust the CIA and the military <laughs> the most of all the institutions in the US government, I would not have believed that. Um, but anyway, so we set up this channel, but then what we did is we had some Cuban Americans in, and I couldn't always meet with them because we didn't want to betray, like why would I be in all those meetings? But I remember I had some meetings um, with people from Miami, the Cuba study group, for instance, and Carl Saladrigas and others, um, who, who sensed that there was a moment that was uh, ripening with the emergence of the private sector in Cuba, with some of the changes happening in the politics of Miami. And, and what they tried to focus us on is, how can you pry things open so as to help this private sector that is emerging in Cuba? And so even in the negotiations, even though they didn't know that we were in negotiations unless they had better information than I thought they did, which they might have, um, they're Cuban after all, um, um, we, um, we were informed by a lot of, of, of views and, and the people like uh, Felice Grodo, who's here tonight, who you know, were uh, closer ear to the ground in Cuba with the younger generation, that sense that if you guys do something, if you guys make a move that is dramatic to open things up, there will be a, a hand extended on the other end from the Cuban people um, who want this. That very much guided our approach in the negotiations. Um, so what kind of a reply did you get? So, you know, you, you send, it was interesting, we sent this message down to the Cubans proposing a dialogue, and we knew that we would get an initial sense of whether they were serious based on who they came back with and said, well, number one, would they meet with us, and two, who would be in the meeting? And they came back and said, uh, we want a meeting, and Alejandro Castro, the son of Raul Castro, will be our representative. So suddenly you're thinking, okay, this is, these guys are ready to talk. You know, they're putting for the right interlocutor. Alejandro was widely seen as kind of the second most powerful person in Cuba after his father, Raul. Um, also kind of a mysterious figure to the United States. He never really interacted with Americans. We didn't know much about him. Uh, so what do you do with that, right? Um, so we call it Canadians. This is back when we, yeah. <laughs> this is back when we were friends with the Canadians. Um, and let me just make a plug for allies for a second. Um, here's why you want allies, right? You want allies because you want to be able to call somebody up and say, hey, we're going to start to talk to the Cubans who we haven't talked to in decades. We want you to host these meetings. We don't want you to tell anybody in your government about it. We'd like a really nice facility. 
we'd like you to make all the arrangements and we can't tell you what's going to happen. And they said, sure. You know? um, and again, that's uh, to make a serious point, that's actually what is so awful about what's happening now is because if that happened today, they'd say no, right? Um, because why would they, you know, d Trump is dis disparaging them and their prime minister. So credit to the Canadians. So um, we set up the first meeting and I fly up to Ottawa on a commercial airplane. I'm met by some very nice Canadian man at the, at the gate. He says, come with me. And we walk around immigration and everything. And we get into a car and he just drives. And I'm like, where's this guy taking me? You know? um, yeah, and, but he's Canadian, so I trust him. You know? <laughs> um, and he's very pleasant. He's describing the weather and the, you know, the vacation patterns. And, and we drive up to a cabin about 45 minutes out of Ottawa, really in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I walk in there, and, and then Alejandro Castro comes in. Um, and I didn't know what to expect. Um, and the Canadians had invented a whole reason for him to be there. They were there for a cybersecurity dialogue, which was not happening, uh, I can assure you. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't know what to expect in that first, first meeting at all. Um, I'm happy to describe it if you want. Yeah, uh, I'm going to yeah. say, uh, um, obvious next question, how, how did that go? So, um, so Alejandro, um, who's kind of a mysterious figure here in Miami, um, he walks in and um, he had never really interacted with Americans, um, but he was gregarious, as all Cubans are. Um, but we sit down and for the first four hours, I got a history lesson. Um, <laughs> and, and I've gotten a, the alternative history lesson here in Miami. But from him, it was, you know, all the attempts to assassinate Fidel, and it was um, the Bay of Pigs invasion, and it was, you know, our, our approach to the revolution, and Posada Carriles, and all this stuff. And I said to him, I was like, I sat very patiently and listened to him. Um, and I finally said, uh, hey, um, I wasn't born when any of those things happened, you know? Uh, I, I actually was sitting here thinking, like, my youth can be a, an asset. And I was like, I'm not interested in talking about any of that stuff. Like, I'm here because President Obama wants to look to the future, you know? Um, and, and he was a bit surprised by that. Um, and then I'll, I'll never forget, we, and I described this in the book, but like, we, we break for lunch, and the Canadians, being good allies, had like a sandwich tray, you know? Um, <laughs> and so we're sitting there eating sandwiches, and he says, um, we should just start talking. I was like, you know, I've never been to Cuba, and it's only 90 miles from Florida, it's such a shame that, like, I, you know, given this relationship, I can't travel there. Um, and he's like, well, Jay-Z and Beyonce were just here. Um, <laughs> and, and I said, uh, well, yeah, you know, we got, a lot of, we got a lot of grief for that in the White House. Uh, and he said, oh, they c carried themselves with such dignity and all this stuff. And we just started chatting, and like, you would chat with anybody over a sandwich. And he finally stopped, and he said to me, he's like, I'm very surprised you're sitting here talking to me uh, as an equal. Um, and he clearly didn't expect that. I think he expected me to come in and yell at him about things. And, and from that moment on, like, I, 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 you know, I knew I had a relationship. Um, I didn't know where it would lead, but uh, just by setting that tone, it kind of opened up a, a, a door that we end up walking through. Right, and, and obviously there were a bunch more uh, meetings, um, mostly, uh, almost entirely in, in Canada, right? Um, uh, but you had some major obstacles to overcome, and, and uh, as you describe in the book, um, they reared their heads fairly quickly uh, in the negotiations once you got down uh, to the serious uh, stuff. Um, Alan Gross... Um, the the five Cuban spies, uh, just to name uh, a few of them. So, um, how did you sort of break through those what appeared at the time to be absolutely insurmountable obstacles? So, you know, the the fastest version I can do of this is that um, they were clearly interested in one thing and one thing only, which is getting their people out of prison. You know, the the Cuban five or the remaining members of the Cuban five were in prison, whereas we were interested in transforming this relationship. Um, and so we kind of argued back and forth for a few meetings. 
there were interesting confidence building measures along the way. Um, I remember, you know, Edward Snowden was in Moscow in the airport there, and he was supposed to get on a flight to Havana. And I remember pulling Alejandro aside and saying, hey, if Edward Snowden ends up in Havana, you know, it's going to be very difficult for us to, to do anything with you guys. Um, and then a week later, I opened up a newspaper and learned that Edward Snowden was denied entry onto a flight to Havana and stayed in Russia. And that was kind of a message, um, even though he didn't say it. Um, in retrospect, you know, it's too bad he ended up in Russia too, like a, a you know, but, um, uh, but we weren't making that much progress. And I remember I finally said to him, like, look, we, we want to transform this whole relationship. Um, and I put the whole relationship on the table. You know, we would like to, uh, you to do X and Y and Z, and, and, and we're prepared to do X and Y and Z. And it kind of caught them off guard for a second. Because um, they thought up until that point it was just a negotiation about prisoners. Um, and they were reluctant to do that. And, and this is something I, I, every time I come down to Miami and get criticized that we gave away so much, what's a hard thing to explain is that the Cubans, to, to, to agree to diplomatic relations and normalization with the embargo in place, with Guantanamo still a US naval base, they did not want to do that. You know? um, and so it was hard to get them there. Um, there are a couple moments that changed things. One was, I think Alejandro never quite, he knew I was close to Obama, wasn't sure if I really spoke for Obama. Um, and Nelson Mandela had his funeral in South Africa, and Raul was there. And whatever you think about the Cuban regime, and there's a lot to criticize about what they've done to their own people, um, you know, they, they did support Nelson Mandela. Um, and so, um, Obama, when he got up to speak, shook Raul Castro's hand. Uh, and Raul looked very surprised by that. Um, and in the next meeting I had, everything had changed. They said, well, now we know Obama's different. And we know he's willing to take a risk. And suddenly they were willing to talk about things like normalization, diplomatic relations. So that little gesture made a big difference. Um, we also found a CIA asset uh, that we wanted to get out of prison uh, in, in Cuba that, that made some type of swap more equitable. But we started to build this bigger package. And I go back to Obama and say, well, I'm, here's where I'm with the Cubans, what should I do? And he's like, just go bigger. Get as much as you can get done in one big bang because we're gonna get a big blowback in Miami. So you might as well do as much as you can. And so, so you know, we, we gave the Cubans a list of political prisoners and uh, we, we obviously the normalization relations and we were prepared to open up greater travel and commerce, and we were just building th the biggest package that we could. Um, and then th that's when we brought the Vatican in. Right. Um, uh, I was, that was going to be my next question. There's I didn't mean to lead you there, but I, I didn't want to just keep well, talking. You know, the, uh, when you read the book, um, if, if those of you haven't read it, and I haven't read the whole of it, um, I've read bits of it, um, the description of uh, Ben and, and Obama going to South Africa uh, is fascinating because it, it, it um, uh, gives an insight into the role that Ben had writing uh, the, the important speeches that President Obama made um, and then President Obama coming back with his own thoughts. And on that flight to South Africa, it, it, there's a fascinating description of all of that in the book. Uh, and it was obviously a, 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 a very important moment um, for the, the, the Cuba uh, talks. But then there's also another wonderful, um, I mean, there's many great passages in the book, but one of my other favorites is the, in the Vatican. Um, and this bit uh, has not been, had not been described at all. Um, you know, some of this story we know, some of it we don't. Um, and, and this is a great part that we, we don't. And I, I love the idea that you guys came up with that um, somehow this deal um, this big deal that Obama wanted needed the blessing yeah. of of somebody big. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so um, it's a, it's such a great scene. Tell us yeah. what happened in the Vatican. So what, first of all, what happened is that like R Ricardo and I um, had long thought that we should get the Vatican involved because you know our governments don't trust each other, and I don't know how many lawyers are in the room, but when you don't trust each other, um, you want a third party to be kind of a guarantor. Uh, and so we always said the Vatican would be good um, <laughs> because they're respected in both countries and they have a lot of political clout here. And um, 
but we proposed this to the Cubans and, and they're worried first. Then Obama went to the Vatican and he met with Pope Francis and they talked a lot about Cuba and, and Obama told him, you know, actually we got something going with the Cubans. We, we were in these talks and Pope Francis said, well, anything I can do to be helpful. And I told the Cubans that and they separated, just like they separated Obama from the US government in a way, they separated Pope Francis from the Vatican. They said, oh, Papa Francisco, you know, um, <laughs> He's a man of Latin America, you know, and so they were interested. Um, so I had um, a, a couple of meetings with a cardinal in Washington, Cardinal McCarrick, about, well, how do, how do you get the Vatican involved in something like this? Like, I don't know, you know, who knows how to do that? And he's like, well, what we will do is we will invite the cardinal from Havana to the White House. And I was like, well, how will we do that? Um, and he's like, some attention. yeah, and he's like, don't worry about it. Uh, I'll have him come speak at Georgetown. He's a Jesuit, um, and and uh, and uh, and I thought, well, okay, you know, like I trust this guy; he knows what he's doing. So we we brought Cardinal Ortega in through a back door at the White House. He brought Obama a letter, which he read aloud, and he had the exact same letter delivered to Raul, basically from the Pope, offering to be helpful on improving relations, a swap of prisoners, and all these things. Um, and so then we set up a meeting at the Vatican. But the interesting thing is the Vatican does no business over email. They don't email, which in retrospect is very smart. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and um, so after we'd agreed to the whole deal, like the normalization of relations, the prisoners exchange, the Cubans, you know, all these things, um, we fly out to the Vatican and we go, we go and it's me and Ricardo and Alejandro and the Cuban delegation. But they don't know why we're there. They don't know how much we've done. They just thought they're hosting a meeting. So the Secretary of State, the number two guy at the Vatican, a guy named Cardinal Perlin, is there. And we tell him, like, we're here to normalize relations. <laughs> and he's like, he didn't believe us. Um, <laughs> so then we had two separate meetings. The first meeting with the Cubans and then with us. He wanted to verify that this was actually happening. So I go in to meet with him. And he says, you guys, you're really normalizing relations with Cuba. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, who are you? <laughs> um, and I was, I was like, I'm Ben Rhodes, and here's what I'm, you know. And he goes, does John Kerry know about this? You know, Because he's looking at me and Ricardo and like, who are these guys? So we walk him through it. But then what was really poignant about it is uh, we end up sitting in this room and reading aloud all the commitments that became the December 17th announcement. And there were there was a guy who had lived in Cuba, um, a priest at the table, who I looked down and he was crying the whole time. And then the cardinal was like clearly moved and he said, you know, in a world where there's just not much reason to hope, like this is going to give people a lot of hope, you know. Um, and I realized in that moment that what we were doing was about the Cuban people and was about some bridge that could be built between the United States and Cuba. But it was also about a bigger, you know, there was going to be a bigger message that the world would consume. Um, and I remember walking out of the Vatican um, and thinking, I know this thing that is going to happen. It, it's a weird experience you can only have in the U.S. government because it was like two months before we made the announcement. I was like, I know this thing that's going to happen that is like going to blow everybody's mind, you know. Um, and it's a good thing. Um, it's, a, it's a right thing. Um, and that was the, the single best feeling I had in, in eight years in government. Well, um, maybe that's actually um, a good moment to um, open it up. Um, it, it was uh, very nice of you guys, obviously, to arrange to uh, announce the deal on the Pope's birthday. Uh, December the 17th was the Pope's birthday. It's also a, an important religion, uh, day in the Cuban calendar, Dia de San Lazaro. And there's one, I, ca I can't remember, there's a third um, anniversary on December the 17th, um, which, I, which escapes me now, which was very... Um, no, that wasn't the one I was Six days about. after my, my first daughter was born, too. So. Oh. Um. <laughs> That's actually why we did it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, like I said at the beginning, um, there was uh, the book encompasses uh, 
you know, all kinds of different uh, policy um, issues that uh, Ben was involved in uh, at the White House. Um, and there's a, there's a moment in the book where um, you describe how there's this kind of realization that, uh, which apparently Obama was ex acutely aware of, that the Cold War uh, was over and the ascendancy of the United States um, was not going to last forever that Obama was convinced it was a transitory moment and something else was uh, going to come. And then there's a fascinating meeting you guys had with the uh, Prime Minister of Lithuania, um, Estonia, Ilman, yeah, yeah. Estonia, yeah, yeah. Um, where he actually warns you guys about Putin and fake news. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe just to sort of make it as broad as possible before we take questions, what to you was sort of um, the, the thing you take away from those White House years, I I sort of from seen from a very high altitude? You know, I guess what I, I take away is that government um, and politics in every country is a human endeavor. And so it represents the good in human beings and the bad in human beings. Um, and the choices that people make um, matter a lot. Um, and, you know, I probably, you know, because I was so young and I went to work in the Obama campaign and we caught this lightning in a bottle, um, probably had an overly optimistic view about human progress. Um, and, yeah, th that's a good anecdote the, in 2014 right when kind of ISIS is emerging and Putin is being aggressive in Ukraine, we met with the Estonian prime minister and he, he said, you know, Putin and ISIS and uh, they, they all represent the pushback to a certain brand of politics, you know, globalization, global integration, inclusion, tolerance, um, that there is across the world a brand of kind of nativism, tribalism, extremism, nationalism, that is pushing back on that. Uh, and obviously Obama represents that. Um, what was interesting is I said you know, to Obama, you know, he just put it together very well. Uh, he, the Estonian president, o Obama said, I know that. I've been dealing with that my whole presidency. Um, what do you think the Tea Party is? You know? um, and so in a weird way, I think Obama felt like um, he was he was not caught off guard. He actually, you know, in part because he's African American, in part because of the nature of his presidency, had felt that pushback his entire time in office. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, we end in the moment where uh, it, the pushback results in, in, to some extent, in Trump. But my my takeaway in general, though, is that, you know, I, I try to tell this to, to people, especially young people. Like the Obama campaign, we just, a bunch of young people showed up, went to work, we had a candidate, we won. If we didn't do that, that wouldn't have happened. And the same people did that for Donald Trump. And politics is an expression of people. And if you, wanna, if you don't like what's happening, then get involved and do something about it. And things can change. Um, and if you don't do that, there are other people who don't agree with you who are gonna do that too. Um, and, 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 and so the, the biggest takeaway is, is that, you know, I believe that more people subscribe to the view of the world that Barack Obama has and that I have, but if we're complacent, there are very reactionary forces uh, everywhere that are going to overwhelm us. But if we get involved, then the real legacy of, of not just Obama, but what he represents is not any policy pursued as important as they are. It's the direction that things are gonna move in the next two years, four years, 10 years. I believe there is a microphone. Does somebody have a microphone? I see a question, I'm afraid, right over here. I should, what, Where are you, we going? You, you keep that one. I'll, okay. I'll give him this one. Thank you. Hi, Ben, and congrats on the book. And I'm Cuban. I don't have a question about Cuba. I want you to comment on, because I'm trying, I'm having a hard time reconciling President Obama, Nobel Prize, with President Obama, who uh, approved more than 500 drone strikes all over the world. Yeah. yeah. 
and I guess you, you could say you're involved in that. And if you could just talk about that and how now in hindsight, how do you feel? Because that with all machine, machine is being inherited yeah. by Trump. Yeah. So even though, like, I think I consider that the drone strikes and the way the casualties are like classified is, is awful. I think it, it would be worse now. And I think if you, you have any regrets regarding that. Well, uh, first of all, I'll tell you his view. It was a very fair question. Um, his view was that we need to dismantle terrorist networks uh, in other countries and that drone strikes um, are actually much less um, devastating in terms of their human consequences than full-scale wars. And so that the ability to be more precise in taking out terrorists and terrorist safe havens, um, it, it, that you know, everybody focuses on the capability, but the question is, that's actually less disruptive than an Iraq or an Afghanistan type war. Now, uh, I began to get more concerned about uh, over time. So, so I was persuaded that there are cases where we need to use a drone, right? If we know there's a, a terrorist attack that is emanating from somewhere, and that can be very clearly established, um, and, and you don't want to send in cruise missiles, you know, if you can be more precise, um, it's good to use uh, a more precise weapon. That said, what I was worried about in, in government, and I describe this in the book, is when the U.S. government gets a capability, they don't like to give it up, right? They like they come up with new justifications to keep using it. Um, and I began to feel like, um, and I can't, it's hard, I can't talk about all of this, but I began to feel like there was a self-perpetuating dynamic associated with drone strikes. And you know, Obama tried to, and did, raise the standards for when we use them and what the, the barometer is for civilian casualties. Um, uh, but, but I agree with the basic premise that um, we should be doing far less and that we should have uh, much stricter constraints it should be a totally, it should be an extraordinary thing to say that we're going to kill somebody in a foreign country. And, and it should be because if we don't do that, people are going to die in our country or die, you know, in large numbers uh, at some someplace. Um, so so I, I kind of am in between where we ended up and probably where you are. Um, I will say, though, that um, on the Trump question, the biggest problem here is that uh, and, and if Obama even did everything that you would want him to do, Congress provides all these authorities. Um, the reality is that the authorization to use military force, the surveillance capabilities, the, the, the drone, like Congress gave all that to Bush after 9-11. The Patriot Act, the, the, the post-9-11 authorizations are all in place, right? So. Um, and Obama would have changed those if Congress would have worked with him. We tried to do that. Um, we had it for two years, and guess, yeah. And you know what happened in those two years? Congress put restrictions on our ability to transfer detainees out of Gitmo. Democrats. Um, the politics of national security in this country are still way overweighted, in my view. And this is where I agree with you, um, in the direction of aggressive military action. Keeping Guantanamo open, and so you, you're totally fair to, to to look at Obama, but it is important for people to know that unless this becomes an issue that members of Congress feel a counterweight to in their decision making, it doesn't even matter who's president. Like these authorization, these authorities are going to be available to whoever is president. You have your hand up there. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I have a, a question that perhaps. One of the things that surprised a lot of people was that when Obama took office, he in some ways moved away from the liberal economic theorists, both on the East Coast, represented by Paul Krugman and Stiglitz, and a large contingent of people that were from the University of Chicago. And in its place, he pointed people like um, Larry Summers, uh, Tim Geithner, and Matt Crew. And I'm trying to wonder what motivated that? What was the purpose of that? And what do you think the consequences were, were for that in the longer term? 
I actually talk about this in the book um, that we had kind of run as outsiders, you know, on foreign and economic policy, you know, uh, against, you know, on foreign policy, you'd had the catastrophe of the Iraq war. On economic policy, you'd had the financial crisis. And we had run against kind of the establishments that brought us there, both Republican and Democratic. And it was kind of jarring to me to see the superiors uh, to me, um, you know, those positions largely filled up with people who'd supported the Iraq war and who'd been responsible for some of the deregulation that um, fed the financial crisis. Um, I think that um, to offer Obama's view, I, I think that the financial crisis was such a seismic event and the economy was in such a free fall that he felt in a way that there was an all hands on deck situation, let's bring everybody in. Um, I do think in retrospect of my personal view, working with both of them, I would continue to find some fault with Larry Summers um, as somebody who was pretty deferential to kind of the markets and the, um, the in, some of the in interests that um, uh, you know, led to the financial crisis. Geithner, I think, gets a bit of a bad rap. Um, you know, I think Geithner, um, I, I was always very impressed with him. And, um, I, I, you know, he, he didn't, you know, there was this, he didn't emerge from that world. I mean, he was a, a public servant. He was a, a, he worked in the Fed. And um, so we, we can go one by one and argue about it. I think that the basic I issue for Obama was I'm coming in. We're on the precipice of a, of a Great Depression. I'm going to surround myself with people who will project a certain degree of confidence to the rest of the world. Um, Well-known people who just they're very – the fact of them being in these positions will kind of calm people down and create some space for me to enact these policies that can get us out of this hole. And if you look at the arc of the presidency – and I, again, worked on this more acutely on farm policy um, – he spent the first couple of years just trying to stabilize things while doing some things like healthcare that were much more obviously ambitious. And he got progressively more ambitious and progressive um, as his presidency went on. He felt more confident in pursuing, I'll just take foreign policy because that's what I worked on, a Cuba opening, an Iran deal, a Paris climate agreement, later in his presidency after things had stabilized. So. For better or worse, um, depending on your view, I think in those initial weeks and months in the first year, he chose in a time of crisis to say, I'm going to bring in kind of the biggest and, and, and uh, most established people to get us out of this hole, and then I'll pivot to um, my, uh, my agenda once I know that we're not going to be in a depression. I uh, have been playing the game that you so well described that you call democracy. And we love to play it. In this part of the country, being a Cuban American, raised as a Democrat, you are half risking your life. I have to tell you, it's been hard. When Mr. Obama got elected, I voted for him. I thought he was going to change. Then I find out that it's for you the way you describe the game, which I very much agree with, that you felt you did, you did something positive in, in Cuba by traveling to Cuba and convincing the Castro government to continue doing the opposite of playing democracy. How can we? What right do you have? What right do I have? 
to go to Cuba and deny the people of Cuba, the 10 million people of Cuba, to enter the game of democracy the way you have described it and the way we play it in our country. Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. I, I am glad you asked this question. It's really, this is the fundamental question. Um, here is what I believe. Um, I believe that the policy of having the embargo in place, um, and, 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 and let me try to give the most generous version of, of the alternative policy. You have the embargo in place to squeeze the Castro regime, to deny them resources. You provide funding to dissidents on the island as best you can, um, and you seek to isolate the Cuban government until there's a change on the island that can allow for a democratic government to emerge. Um, my really fundamental belief was that, that that wasn't working, that essentially the embargo, the Cuban government had learned how to get enough of a lifeline that it could survive the embargo and had decades to do that, that they were not threatened by our democracy funding, um, that in some ways they had kind of utilized that to create some pageantry around the existence of an internal en enemy that, uh, that, that they almost turned into a propaganda element for them. And that if what you really want is to give the Cuban people a, a better shot at what you want for them, whether a democracy, economic opportunity, that that policy wasn't, wasn't working for them. Um, so what is an alternative approach? I truly believe that if we just said, we are going to remove the impediments that have been put in place by the US government. And I would say that I, if I could, if I uh, could, I would remove the embargo. Um, that if you could do that, number one, the, the life of the Cuban people would improve. I mean, they, they do suffer under this policy. They, they are denied resources. It, it, the poverty is crushing. And a big part of that is because of the Castro government. The biggest part of that even is because they have a, a, a backward economic model and political model. But part of that is us. I mean, we have to acknowledge it. And part of it is that that, that stuff doesn't get in. Um, but secondly, that I'll start with the economy and then go to the politics. On the economic front, one of the strangest things is that if we wanted them to liberalize tomorrow, they couldn't. They, they could not, because of our laws, they, they couldn't have private companies come in. They couldn't uh, open up their economy because we prevent that from happening. Uh, no, it, it, the reality is that, that we don't even allow Cuba to engage in any financial transactions with private corporations, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Well, the Cuba, we, so what we did is we said there's this emerging sector. There's an emerging private sector. That's the opportunity we saw. And we said we'll open up, up as much space for resources to reach those people as possible. And then we want to create incentives for that economy uh, that if there's such momentum that from the influx of travel and the influx of resources from Americans traveling and American businesses getting a foothold there, uh, that, that you then have, you create incentives for them to reform their economy. But the, the bigger point I want to make here is that I, you know, people would say to me, well, so our basic bet was if this is opened up, and people are traveling there, and American businesses are doing business there, and there's greater access to information there, and there's greater internet access there, that ultimately the Cuban people will be empowered and be in a stronger position to be able to control their own lives. And that will probably start economically, but that ultimately that will lead to a political evolution in Cuba. Probably not a revolution, an evolution. So to be candid here, this will take some time. And people would say to me, well, that didn't happen in Vietnam and China, and I'd say, well, Vietnam and China are really, really big countries, and they're not 90 miles from Florida. And there's not a Cuban-American population that's living 90 miles from Florida that is worth more than X times the GDP of Cuba. Um, so I, I, my belief was, look, we've been in this business 
for, for, for decades of saying, you know, the casters want to run Cuba forever, and we want to basically determine how that changes and who runs Cuba. I want us to get out of the way and let the Cuban people figure it out. You know, and, and if they get access to more resources and they have access to more ideas and more information, they're going to figure it out. I mean, uh, you know, they, they, and they'll be able to create the pressure from inside for change. And, and, and things are going to change. Fidel Castro is already dead. Raul Castro is already stepping aside. Um, so I know that this is a hotly contested thing here, and I deeply respect that in a way that I never could understand. People whose families were killed or chased out of Cuba or had their property confiscated by the Castros, there's something just uh, completely unacceptable to them about dealing with them. But here's the last point I want to make. I, I also believe, based on, on not just my experience with Cuba, but other countries, if we squeeze them and squeeze them and squeeze them, if they collapsed, like let's say we actually achieved the objective of the embargo and the pressure campaign, the people who take over that country are not the dissidents. It's the worst actors. Like the people, if Cuba collapsed, it would be the worst military actors who would be the most likely to be able to take power. Whereas if you have some evolution and you create some space for different people to emerge in different sectors, economic, cultural, social, maybe some younger people, even in the Communist Party, who are like, you know, I'm a 40-year-old technocrat, and I know in 20 years that this model is not going to work, so maybe I want to get uh, into a different place. That was our bet. Um, I don't claim to have certainty about it, but uh, I do believe that in my limited, uh, admittedly limited time in Cuba and talking to Cubans there, they believe that too. That if you talk to younger Cubans, they thought the more this opened up and the more they could interact with people, the more likely it is that there could be some positive change in their lives. Um, and so our whole policy, I used to, you know, Ricardo and I used to say, like, we have to keep reminding ourselves it's about two things. It's about what can improve the lives of the Cuban people, just their livelihoods, that they're day to day living a better life, and what might give them a greater opportunity to, to have some control over what the future of their country is. Um, that's what we were trying to do. Um, and, and, and we believe that engaging the Castro government was more likely to bring that about than not. Um, I respect people who dis disagree with that. I also respect people who say, I don't even care if you're right about that. I don't want to engage those people. Uh, I remember when I, um, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there um, because I think it's important. But I, I do hope that as this goes on, that like there, there's some pragmatism uh, about finding that mix of, of, of policies and approaches that is above all about especially as Fidel and now Raul are moving out of the scene, like what is going to make this more likely to lead in a better direction with the Cuban people and, and, and not just be about, because the Cuban government likes nothing more than it to just be about the historical conflict, right? That's what they know how to do. Um, um, uh, you know, we were trying to create a new space. I, I am not Cuban. Uh, <laughs> um, earlier this evening, you mentioned that you had a rather, you expressed it as a naive sense of human progress. Um, and it's something that I've also rather naively always believed in. And over the past year, you've maybe lost it. The, the, the other thing that you mentioned was that you were, in, in considering drone strikes, um, you were worried about just how the inevitability of things continuing the way, once things have started, they carry on like that. So really my question is, um, over the past 18 months, and I can't blame this all on the, on the current administration, but the vulgarity, the brutality of modern life um, seems to be going in a certain direction, and over, certainly over the past 18 months, uh, the vulgarity of expression, the vul I mean, obviously at the moment we're all concerned about treatment of children on borders, but just all over, there seems to be, with the, with the, with the, the, the acceptance of lies, the acceptance of, 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 of bad behavior that 
previously would have been unacceptable. So my, so because you know the ins and outs of government, my question is, do you think after an administration change that we can go back to where we were, to the, the, to the, 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 the highlights of, um, of, of, of the Obama administration where, 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 the, where there was basic decency or are we, are we condemned to continue down the slippery slope? So the very quick, I'll try to, it's, a, it's the question, right? Um, I'll, I'll, uh, the, we don't want to go forward, we want to go back. Yeah, number one, the, you get the government, you know, we're in a democracy, you get the government that reflects who you are. Um, and I think we're better than this government. I think this country is better than this government. And, you know, Barack Obama used to tell me, our whole job is to tell a story about who we are as a country. Um, through our, not just our words, but our actions, how we carry ourselves, what our policies are. Um, and if people don't like what they see, there's a democracy. There's an election in November, and then there'll be another election in two years, and you could vote these people out, and you can have a different government that reflects what you want. And if we don't do that, well, then we are going to be a country of lies and, and, and brutality and dishonesty. It's on us. I mean, there's no other way to, to, to say it. Um, the second thing I'd say quickly is that that's important domestically, m above all. But one of the things that troubles me when I travel around the world is that it's not just Trump that worries kind of the governments of our allies. Um, we were joking about Canada before. It's that we elected Trump, right? Um, and so people are like, well, what is, you know, what is this? Who, maybe we don't know the Americans as well as we thought. Um, I was in Japan as a washed up government official, former government official. <laughs> you know, you go to Japan, you talk to a group of business people. And I was there at the, the height of the North Korean tensions, meeting with some Japanese business people, a country that has counted on America for their survival since World War II, essentially. And I thought they'd just be full of questions about North Korea. All they wanted to talk about was Charlottesville. And what I realized is that they, they were trying to figure out, like, okay, we've counted on these people. We may not have agreed with all of their foreign policies. And let me let you in on a secret. No country in the world has agreed with all of our foreign policies. But they thought we were the best bet in the world. We were the strongest democracy. We, were the, we had it figured out. We didn't have crazy people running our country. Like, you know, and, and so I think that what happens in the next two elections is going to be critically important at home, but also around the world to tell people, are we the country that elected Donald Trump or was that an aberration? Thank you. Uh, I want to get back to Cuba. <laughs> um, talking about the opening and the, um, the great admiration for Barack Obama by the young generation in Cuba, uh, the opening he made to the private sector there, uh, what are your thoughts on what's happened since the election and you know, the halting of the Cuenta Propista licenses? Um, you know, I, as someone who's a Observed Cuba for my entire life. Uh, I, you know, I I did see hope in what Obama was doing. I saw the greatest change in all the years that I've been watching it, and it's been very sad to see the people that we worked with. Yeah. I, I was one of the organizers of 10 by 10 K Cuba, uh, yeah. the tech yeah. competition. Great program, yeah. Last year we organized the John first John and Rick. Yes, and, yeah. yeah, the first uh, Cuban pavilion at the TechCrunch conference in New York and brought Cuban entrepreneurs here. It was so exciting. So my heart breaks that that all these people we've been working with are now kind of just halted in their progress. Uh, they can't move their business ideas forward. We can't get them to come to this country as entrepreneurs because of the embassy closure there. And yeah. so, you know, there was progress that was happening and now it's halted, at least the way I see it. So the way I see this is, is, is there was kind of a perfect storm. Um, for all the criticism that we got for not pushing hard enough, uh, I actually think when Barack Obama went and the speech he gave uh, in Havana, pushed way too far for what the Cuban government, I mean, after that speech, you saw a, a beginning of a backlash, right? So Raul, um, whatever you think about him, was way out ahead of Fidel um, in, re in reaching out to the United States. Fidel did not want to do that. 
And when Obama is standing there talking about elections and democracy and Miami, um, which I think is still the right thing to do, because as I say in the book, in life, a basic principle is, if you have a chance, tell people what you actually believe. So I'm glad he did that. So I'm not second guessing that. But I'm saying there was already a bit of a, a fight that had broken out in the Communist Party about, did we let the, Amer did we let the Trojan horse in with these entrepreneurs and with Obama and, you know. Um, and then Trump gets elected. And so the people who were on the side of this was a mistake say, see, we told you so. Like, you can't trust these Americans, and this is a big mistake. But Raul kind of said, no, no, let's keep this, you know. And then um, what I basically think has happened since then is Trump's announcements, which were basically uh, your senator, Marco Rubio's announcements, because that policy is written. No, no, but it, I mean, it's, uh, the honest truth is that was not, Donald Trump doesn't, didn't think about Cuba for a second, okay? Um, he thought, well, I'll give this to Rubio, right? Um, and so Rubio wrote that policy. Um, and it had the, the effect, in my view, of basically just hitting like, you're moving down a track and hitting a pause button. And suddenly, the, we're not doing anything. We're not gonna engage, we're not gonna lean in. We're not gonna roll all the way back. I mean, what was fascinating is to hear them try to frame the policy around helping entrepreneurs when everything they did was gonna hurt them. It was, a, it was the most, I mean, this is where I would take issue with your junior senator, is um, <laughs> the, 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 he, he saw that the political winds were shifting a bit down here. So they are shifting enough that he felt the need to say, we're gonna do this to help the, the small businesses and the private sector in Cuba. And we're not gonna listen to them at all, right? And let me just say this again, like, why not try listening to the Cuban people? Forget the Cuban government, the Cuban people. If you think you wanna help entrepreneurs, then listen to them. Because if you cut back on travel, and if you cut back on, the, uh, on basically just the opening of the United States and Cuba, you're gonna hurt those people. And that's exactly what's happened. So my sense is that there's been this convergence of hardliners in Cuba who wanted to roll back the opening, and hardliners here who wanted to roll back the opening, that has basically conspired to hurt, above all, the very people we say we wanna help which are entrepreneurs and Cubans who are trying to, to take advantage of this moment. I don't think though that it's a full reversal. It's just, it's just a, a missed opportunity. Um, it's also the wrong time to be doing that because you have a new leadership in Cuba, Diaz-Canal, you have all these new people coming in. That's when we should actually be trying to figure out who these people are and what they're doing. And, and we have no embassy. It's the worst possible time to be drawing down the embassy. Um, so my, my feeling is, watching it, it's not like it, they went back to pre-December 17th, it's that they just stopped all this momentum, moved it back a bit. My hope is that the pendulum can swing back, things can open back up again, and we can take advantage of some of the momentum that things like 10 by 10 were you know, trying to, to capitalize upon. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, we'll see. Thank you. you. You already partially uh, answered my question, because um, I think you do believe that after Obama's visit and Obama's well-crafted and beautiful speech in Havana, the Cuban government got scared and uh, didn't take the opportunity of the advantage that you gave them. But I'll expand on that question and see if you have any opinion of what's happened. What happened, because I think it started at the end of the Obama administration, with the people that got sick in Cuba which is such a really yeah. strange thing. Thank so you. So it's the strangest thing. Um, I, I didn't even know about this until I went down to Havana for a couple of weeks in July of 2017. And I met with some people in the embassy and they told me about this. So we didn't know this was, was happening. Um, and I'd make a couple points about this. Number one, um, I found it very difficult to believe that the Cuban government had done this for a couple of reasons. One, the Trump administration hasn't said the Cuban government did it, and they have every incentive to say that they did, um, which almost tells me that they know somebody else did it, and then, you know. Um, but uh, the second thing I'd say about that is, whoever did it, it, if it was an act of 
if it was an action that was taken, you know, and I'll come back to that, if, it, if someone was deliberately trying to harm people, um, whoever was trying to do it was trying to spoil the relationship between the United States and Cuba. Um, my experience, and this is why I'm skeptical of the Cuban government, is that after the election, when apparently the stuff started to, to pick up, the Cubans were desperate to preserve the opening with us. And so I made multiple trips, they're signing business deals, they're signing memory, MOUs, you know, agreements with our government. Um, they were trying to, to establish a channel to the Trump administration. They made the mistake of asking me to help them in doing that, and I said, like, <laughs> Trump people don't think that highly of me. Um, but the notion that at the same time that they were doing that, they would do something that they would know would just destroy this whole relationship um, doesn't, doesn't have the ring of truth with me. And by the way, n neither Jeff DeLaurentis, who was our charge at the time, or Scott Hamilton, who followed him, thought that either. Um, so who is it? Um, my best guess um, was Russians and Cubans together. Um, so the Russians have every incentive to blow up the relationship. They feel like we went into their neighborhood in Ukraine, and so they're going to come into our neighborhood. And, but uh, to be clear, probably working with some Cubans, because there's a lot of hardliners there who didn't like this either. They could have been working together to do this. I describe in the book that during my negotiations with the Cubans, when it was secret, I was tailed by Russians uh, a number of times. Um, it was a weird experience. I was in a, I walked into a hotel in Toronto, and I'm checking in, and this couple that looks very conspicuous, big, <laughs> tattooed, walks up to me and stands about six inches from my face, holds up an iPhone, and takes a picture of me. <laughs> and it was Russians. And they wanted me to know that they were watching. You know? And the first time I went to Havana, they tra tailed me and talked in Russian very loudly. And so I felt this kind of heavy Russian hand. Um, so that was my operating theory until some people started to get sick in China <laughs> from the same thing. Um, and that made me think another theory could be true, which is that this is a surveillance technology gone horribly wrong because the secret, which is not really secret, is that there's a handful of governments that spy really aggressively on each other. And if you have some collection of surveillance things that are pointed into a location, you might create that effect. Um, so I hope we learn the answer. Um, and I, I really hope so because in part, it's not good for our embassy to be drawn down this much. We can't even issue visas there. Um, so I'd like to see that restored. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes, for coming down here. Um, I'm Nicaraguan American. I immigrated in 89. And um, I, I want to know what you would think what the next five years in Latin America is going to look like, seeing how Mexico is having elections, Colombia just had their elections, and what Nicaragua is going through. Yeah. <laughs> well. Uh, it's a good note to end on. I, I, when we came into office, you know, Chavez and the Chavistas had kind of w were on a roll. Um, and Obama's basic view of that was, let's stop giving them the oxygen of being their antagonist, because um, they, they, they thrive on that, right? And, um, and the Cuba opening was part of that, you know, to take, take, take away that uh, element of it. And I'll never forget being on the, uh, the last trip to Havana, I w or second to last trip to Havana I went to, um, it, was, um, it was not something I wanted to do, but um, uh, I was basically, um, you know, the only one, I was invited to the, the funeral for Fidel Castro. Um, uh, given who he is, I didn't really want to go, but given where the state of the world was and our relations, I felt like I should go and just try to keep this thing going. And, um, but I'm sitting on the dais there, and you felt that the momentum was not with these people, right? And then Maduro speaking, and Ortega, and, uh, and Evo, and you're think, you know, it felt like the opposite of eight years ago. I mean, I know what you think, Dave. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, they, they just, the message was not fresh, you know? <laughs> it was kind of like 70s, you know, the Che poster and the, you know. Um, and um, I worry now, though, that like the the Trump is breathing fresh oxygen into that type of uh, politics in Latin America, 
um, in a way that will shape probably the Mexican election. And, um, and you know, what I would like to see in general, first of all, what I'd like to see, I'd like to see the politics of this hemisphere not be about the United States versus something. You know, just let's, it should be about the things that we're all trying to do together, you know. Um, and, and that's actually better for us and ultimately, I think, better for people in Nicaragua and, and, and Latin America generally. Um, and and I, I fear that if, if Trump um, ratchets this up, it will only be to the benefit of people who thrive on that type of conflict and will be back in the kind of ideological Cold War that, you know, has shaped uh, the politics of, of not just Miami, but, you know, the, this hemisphere. Um, I, I think that's not where people are headed in Latin America. I mean, my, my own sense was that people were looking for governments that, whether they were left or right, could actually deliver for them and be less corrupt. You know, like my, if you looked at the pattern of elections over the last kind of five to seven years, it wasn't left or right. It was people looking for, for leadership that was more responsive to them, that was less corrupt, that um, turned a page in some, uh, some respects. Um, so I still feel like that's the, the broader direction in the hemisphere, um, uh, with Venezuela as this kind of complete uh, outlier. Now, Nicaragua um, uh, is interesting because there, I feel like you just have a, a leadership that is, is outlasted its uh, kind of legitimacy with its own people um, and its welcome. And, and, and some of this is obviously Danny Ortega, but his wife was always a strange figure when we were in office. Like we, I was telling Dave, like we'd go down there and she'd be in all the meetings and she was increasingly clearly the decision maker. And you could tell that that wasn't sitting well, you know, with anybody. Um, and so um, I, I, I think you're gonna have some convulsions there and what I would hope would happen is that there's some process to make sure that all of the uh, contested politics is somehow channeled into an election. Um, because you don't want an, a Venezuela type situation where you have a, a government hanging on with paramilitary support and an opposition that is, um, doesn't have those levers of power but is strong enough to contest that. I mean. So I would hope that, that there's a regional effort to support a process that channels the unrest that we see in Nicaragua right now into some election. And, and by the way, that, that isn't zero sum, um, you know, like if, um, that, 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 you know, the pendulum swinging back and forth between it's like either all Danny Ortega or all the opposition that's a recipe, I think, for some, there has to be some um, a, some effort to, by whoever wins the election, which would probably be the, op would be the opposition, I think, to, 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 to not be that punitive um, and, and to, uh, to try to hold the country together. Um, and again, I think that's what people want in Nicaragua and Latin America. I, I could be wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm just offering one man's opinion, but the, my, the, my sense of these recent, the recent politics in the region is People are tired of, of all or nothing politics, of corruption, of ideology. They want just results in their own lives. Um, that's what the U.S. should, should be about. Um, I don't have great hopes that we will. Um, but then again, like, you know, as I've said to some of the countries when I left, like, oh, hopefully Trump doesn't pay attention <laughs> and you just, you know. Um, uh, but, but again, I, it's gonna tend on, I mean, I, I think that that's um, that's uh, that's what I hope for the region. And again, like all these places look to Miami, you know, um, and to the diaspora here, and and so there's a role for people here to play um, as kind of the bridge, obviously, between the United States and Latin America. Um, that's what I love about Miami, um, and uh, and that's why I'm, I'm so glad to be here tonight. And by the way, everybody should buy my book <laughs> and buy uh, a friend copy, but they should also get 
this amazing cookbook uh, <laughs> that I just found, uh, The Cuban Table, um, which I'm going to cook out of. So, yeah. Uh, he, uh, Benny's going to be staying around uh, to sign uh, copies. So. I want to thank Ben, and I, I want to thank um, Alan as well. Let's give him a big round of applause. I, I also want to say that it's probably a little historic, and you can let me know if it's true or not, but this must be the first event that Ben has had where the country of Iran was not mentioned. Is that, is that probably true? <laughs> <laughs> it's Miami, right? Well, I ruined it. But again, I want to thank you both for being here. And thank you to PJ as well for the introduction. And we do have uh, plenty of books for sale. They're at the registers. Ben will be signing on the other side of the store. And so if you sort of form a line that way, we would appreciate it. Thank you all for coming.